happen. All right, ladies and gentlemen, welcome to Torah studies. Torah studies. That's what we do in Torah studies. We study, Torah. study Torah. You guys have been coming to, to Torah studies for many years. Yes. Right? Mm -hmm. We're talking. We did a calculation on Shabbos. How many years? First time you ever came to Torah studies? 14? 14, 14, 15 years. That's incredible. Yeah, that's like 13, let's call it 14 years. Amazing. Amazing. All right. We'll see if we got something new. We'll see if we got something new up my sleeve. All right. This is a repeat from 2013. I'm kidding. This is all, no, it's all brand new. All brand new. Not a new Torah, but new insights, new angles. All right. Let's welcome Alex. Dr. Alex, welcome. Great to have you. Okay, so let's get started. Let's rock and roll. Torah portion is Korach, and Korach is an absolute fiasco. Okay, Korach is just craziness. The whole Torah portion. Well, at least as it starts the thing is the torah portion is wild it goes bananas we got someone there so first of all first of all let's explain who the characters are okay moses okay let's start with god god we know ish 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 okay god there's god giving you the major players then we got moses right moses i remember when i did a play i've told i've told you about this story montreal the much I was Moses. I was Moses. And I had a sheep and a staff and a whole deal. Yeah. Hey, good to welcome. You made it through the storm. Oh, yeah, it is cold. Yeah. There were penguins lined up outside. They're looking to get in because they heard it's nice and cool. I'm kidding. So anyway, um, the play. Thank you. So I, um, I was Moses and my, a good friend of mine was Pharaoh. So we were like, you know, friends. And so Moses and Pharaoh were actually friends. It's like a whole thing. Yoni, right? I got a joke in the middle of the story. You guys ready for this joke? Okay. So this guy goes to, um, guy goes to, give me like a religious city in South America. What's a, like a very Catholic city in Brazil, right? Rio de Janeiro? Rio? Rio. Rio, baby. Yeah, okay, good. Rio. All right. Rio, let's just go Rio, and there's a Catholic church, Rio, it's holiday season, it's holiday season, December, yeah, happy holidays from your friends at Rio, okay, so now uh, this, this fellow walks by, and he sees, no, sorry, there's two people sitting in front of the church, okay, it's like maybe like midnight mass, if that's a thing, I think it's a thing, yeah, I think it's a thing, yeah, no, I think midnight mass, yeah, there's like a whole thing, so, so there, there they are, two people sitting around the church. One dressed in either a Catholic here or a Santa here, whatever, whatever your favorite version of this uh, story is. And then the other one's dressed like a Hasidic Jew. And everyone walks by on their way to or from Mass and sees these two people, the Hasidic Jew, and then the Catholic-looking individual. Everyone's giving to the Catholic-looking individual. In fact, they're giving more. They're like, you, what? More. There's extra money to the guy who looks like he belongs. Anyway, there's one fellow who walks by at some point and gets very frustrated with the Jew. He says, buddy, you should go to Brooklyn. What are you doing here? Right? Why are you here? It's the wrong place, wrong time, wrong context. He says, in fact, because you're here, people are giving more to the other guy. You should leave, get out of here. The Jewish guy turns to the Santa guy, turns to the Catholic looking guy and says to him, Maishala, they're telling us how to do business. Look at that. How funny. Anyway, yeah, yeah, yeah. It's a whole thing. Buy out the competition. Not buy out the competition, but create the competition. You got the whole market corner. Back to our story. Back to our story. So it's, not, it's such a buildup. And it, anyway, so Mo, so Pharaoh was my friend. And when I introduced myself, he's like, who are you? I said, Moses. He said, noses. So anyway, that was it. That was the whole thing. It was funny back then. But moving along, the characters of our story are God, Moses, Aaron, Korach. Who is Korach? Ben Yitzar, Ben Kahas, Ben Levi. Korach was the son of Yitzar, the son of Kahat, the son of Levi. He was the great grandson of OG Levi, Levi, i.e., the son of Jacob, one of the 12 original sons, original sons, 12 only sons of Jacob, and the father of the Levi tribe. So Korach was a first cousin of Moses and Aaron. 
first cousin. Okay, so you can imagine back in the day, they were hanging out together in the summer, they got the beach house together, the whole thing in the, in the desert, they were hanging out. Anyway, the Torah tells us that Korach stages an absolute mutiny. He stages a coup or an attempted coup against the leadership of Moses and Aaron. He gathers the people, he rallies the people, he says to the people, he says, uh, oh, sorry, he says to Moses and Aaron in front of the people, Kol ha'am kulam kadoshim. The entire nation is all holy. So why do you elevate yourselves over the congregation of God? In other words, everybody's holy. God spoke to everyone at Sinai. Every human being, certainly every Jew, has a direct connection with God. So Moses and Aaron, essentially, who died and put you in control? Like, what? how are you guys, like, who made you in charge? And the story unfolds that Moses tries to quell this, this, um, this, uh, this mutiny, and he tries to calm it down, and he tries to reason with them once, twice, three times. Doesn't work. Ultimately, ultimately, um, he warns them that if they don't stop, things are going to happen. Things are going to get crazy, and indeed they do. So what happens? Let's begin with text two a. Okay, let's begin with text two a. And uh, let's see what happens at the end. So here's what we're going to do tonight. Let me just tell, outline a little, little uh, uh, big picture what we're doing tonight. We're going to read a little bit of the story of Korach and specifically focus on its aftermath, i.e. the punishments or the, you know, the comeuppance, as it were, to Korach and his, and his crew. Uh, we're going to ask some questions. Then we'll speak about the general uh, position that Korach took and why that was wrong, even though it might seem like it was correct. And we'll get into four levels of unity, and then we'll wrap it up with uh, explaining how Korach was ahead of his time, but that is not always a good thing. In this case, it was a bad thing, and the lessons we can learn from that. Okay, that's the whole class in an outline. Now, now let me fill it in. That's the outline. Now we're going to color it in. Okay, so we go to the end. Um, but before we do that, I realize that we should probably fill in a few more details. So that is that Korach, so who was part of the, of the, of the mutiny? So there was Korach. He was the ringleader. Um, there was Datan and Abiram. Okay, those were two individuals that always had an issue with Moses. Then, uh, then there was On, who dropped out of the, of the coup at some point, so he's not a major player. And then the next major player, there were 250 individuals, firstborns, 250 uh, Bukharim, firstborn, uh, that joined this, uh, this, this group. Okay, so with that being said, Donna, I'll ask you to please read text away, but hold on first, let me share my screen with ya give me a second please friends romans and countrymen lend me your ears okay here we go all right take it away please speak to the congregation saying withdraw from the dwelling of korah datan and abiram the earth beneath them opened its mouth and swallowed them in their houses and all the men who are with korah and all the prophets so what happens is Moses uh, relays a warning. Sorry, God tells Moses to relay a warning. God says to Moses, speak to the congregation, telling them withdraw from the dwelling of Korach, Datan, and Abiram. Again, those were the three major players, the three leaders of this. And what happened was the earth opens up and swallows, him or and swallows them and their houses, their property, etc. Okay, you ever see a sinkhole? Yeah, kind of, sort of like that, but there's a difference. Why is it different? It's just for people. Huh? This one's filled with the swamp. This one's filled with that. Uh, uh, it'll sink. only consume those people. Those people go to only their areas. What else is interesting about the language here? The earth, look look at verse 32. The earth beneath them opened its mouth and swallowed them and their houses. What is it? What does swallowed mean? Huh? Yeah, yeah, good, good. Giving human quality. What else? How is this different than a sinkhole? What happens with a sinkhole? It, it just, it's not proactive. So swallowing is more proactive. Good. What else? What else? What else is swallowing in the cave? When you swallow. It's opened and closed. Oh, oh, oh no, good. Say, that, say it again. O opened and closed over them. Love that. Excellent. Excellent. Your typical sinkhole is just going to be a hole that's open and just things fall in. Right? This is it opens. Things fall in, people, and things fall in, and then it closes. 
right? It's like the mouth. You put something in your mouth and you close the mouth and you swallow. So excellent, excellent, good. Um, okay, so just something to think about as we move along with the story. Now, something else happened because the 250 people that were, 250 firstborn that were along with Korach, Nathan, and Abiram, so they had been, uh, they brought fire pans as part of this thing of like, we're all, we can also be priests and have the priestly duty and it shouldn't just be up to Aaron and his sons that we also want to do it and blah, blah, blah. So they brought fire pans, um, also called censers. It's a fancy name for it, along with coals or fire, or wood or some, some sort of uh, fire source, and then incense. What happened to those people? I'm glad you asked. Uh, Donna, please read text 2B as well on the next page. A fire came forth from God and consumed the 250 men who had offered up the incense. Okay, so that's what happened with these guys. So the earth swallows up Korach, Datan, and Abiram, and then a fire consumes the 250 men. By the way, this, this happened, these, these things happened in different locations. They weren't all together. The 250 men that were that brought up the incense, offered up the incense, they were in the Mishkan area. The tents of Korach, Datan, and Abiram were in the living quarters where they were living, respectively. Korach was with the Levite camp. Datan and Abiram were from the tribe of Ruvain, which was, again, a different space. By the way, in, in, in the desert encampment, there were three spaces. There's the inner space of the Mishkan, right? The actual tabernacle itself surrounding the Mishkan, like right outside the Mishkan itself, were the Levites and the Kohanim. And then around them, think of like concentric, if that's the right term, I don't know if that's true, like circles, right, fanning out. And then the outer circle, so the inside was the Mishkan, outside of that was the Levites, and outside of them were the, uh, the general populace. So the 250 men were burned in the Mishkan, and then Korach's house collapsed in his area right outside the Mishkan. And uh, then Datan and Abiram, their houses collapsed and they collapsed as well into the earth, got swallowed by the earth in their living quarters in the south. Does that make sense? Typically, I don't know. I, 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 certainly as a kid, when we learned this, I thought like everything happened in the same, same space. But if their houses got swallowed and they lived in different places, well, then guess what? It happened in different places. And if these guys brought the 250 fire pans in the Mishkan and then they got consumed, then that happened in the Mishkan. Are you guys with me on this? Just clear, just this is all informational, clarifying. Yeah. Did this happen with the fire pans part after Abihu Yes. Okay, so have... This happened immediately after, at least the Torah mentions it after. So the Torah's chronology is it talks about the sinkhole, the, the swallowing of Karata the Nabiram. And then it talks about the fire pan bringers getting burned by the fire. The fire pan people, this happened after Aaron's sons brought the unsolicited fire and were. That happened uh, before. That happened in a separate incident. Okay. That was a separate incident right. where, um, where Nadav and Avihu, the sons of Aaron, brought fire that they, right. That was a separate incident that happened uh, upwards of. When did this happen? Upwards of three to six months prior. Yeah. Rashi actually says that. Rashi points out that a lot of uh, negative things happen when people brought incense. I mean, Rashi that, and I have the same bond. Yeah. Yeah. Rashi got it from you, is what I'm really trying to say. Yeah. Okay. So I want to ask three questions. So now we know the aftermath of the story. So we have this attempted coup, and then the people that try to do it so they got swallowed or they got so question number one i'm gonna ask i think three questions when i say i think i i know the questions but it depends uh, questions two and three could could constitute one question or two i think of it as two questions but you'll see what i mean question number one you know god could do anything right that's clear god in this case meets out two different types of punishments to individuals that were part of the same collective are you with me on this the collective of people who were trying to overthrow the leadership of Moses and Aaron. So you had Korach, Dutton, and Abiram, and the 250 fire pan bringers. And their punishments are different. So the question is, why doesn't God mete out the same punishment to all 253 people? Why three and then 250? You with me on that? I know you can always ask questions like, why does God do this or that? But it's a valid question, and especially when you have a valid answer. Yeah. Okay, the three were the leaders, the 250 were the followers. Okay, but why them swallow and why them burn? Like, what's the, what's, 
Why two different punishments? Why not just one punishment for all? Okay, so once okay, so hold on. So that's question number one. Question number two. So again, question one is not specifically about the earth swallowing people and fire consuming people. It's more of a question of why two different punishments? Why not just one? You make it easy, right? One app for all. Right. Good. So if you didn't have, so right, you can't really ask about on God, but in this case, we have a good answer. So we're asking to get to an answer. That's that's really what's going on here. So again, question number one is why two different punishments? Question number two is why specifically these punishments? Why the earth, it's very, very, obviously it's very strange, the earth opening up and swallowing people and property alive and then closing back up. It's weird. And then the fire burning people. Okay, that's also maybe a little less weird, but that's still also a little bit strange. So why specifically these punishments? The third question is, we have, a, there's a concept that when it comes to reward and punishment, it's less of an extrinsic experience and more of an intrinsic experience. Let me explain. There's different types of punishment. You know what? I feel like taking a, another step or two or 12 back. Criminal justice, a favorite topic of mine, criminal justice, right? We've, we've had many conversations and all of us have had conversations about the criminal justice system. We had a course a few years ago from JLI called Crime and Consequence, all about criminal justice reform. So one thing that's interesting is if you ask someone in our country, why is it that when someone commits a crime, why do we prosecute them? Why do we punish them? Now, if you ask someone that question, let's say, theoretically, let's say I ask you that question. Let's say I ask you that question, right? Which I actually am. I'm going to ask you the question. Why do we punish criminals? Someone does a crime, we punish them. Someone steals, we throw them in jail. Why? Now, now hold on. I, I know the first thought you're thinking is, obviously, they did a crime, they should be punished. I get that. See if you can wait, if, see if you can row past that. Past the layer of obvious, but without thinking of, of an actual answer why. The question is why? Why? What's the rationale for punishing a criminal? To deter. To deter who? Future criminals. Okay. Oh, perfect. Okay, great. So to one protect society. Oh, okay. Well, hold on. So let's do it one at a time. So one rationale would be to deter others from committing the same crime. Right? You with me on this? So deter others. So we say to this person, we're gonna make an example out of you so that no one else does this. Yeah, it's amazing. It's very successful. Right. Super successful. Right. So we're going to make, well, make an example out of you so that no one else does. So when, when you make an example out of someone, does the punishment have to fit the crime? No. no. I, to make an example, go big. I, okay, listen. If it's about <laughs> the spectacle, right, go weird. I, are you not with me on this? Uh, hold on. That was the war on drugs. It was extreme punishment. Tar and feathering. What do you mean? That drawn and co drawn quartering. You want to make an example? You really want to make an example? Go big. So they stole something. So that's it. You do something, you know, wild and crazy. I, I'm not advocating for this. I'm just saying if that's the objective, if you want it to really be successful, you know, okay. So then so then, so then be successful. Then, then, <laughs> well, don't go halfway. Go all the way. Um, another rationale. We had oh, other keep them to keep them from doing it again. To keep that person from doing it again, again, and that that rationale will lead to doing something big and uh, big and grand. What else? What What are some other reasons why we punish? Well, because there has to be there have to be consequences for someone breaking the law. Why? Because otherwise, there's chaos, and then you're saying so. But is that the same as trying to deter others from doing the same thing, or is that a little bit different? No, that's different. It's a little bit different. You're saying to maintain law and order. Yeah. You have there have to be consequences. Okay. Okay. It represents negative reinforcement. It represents negative. If you don't punish them, then it would be negative. Re uh, wait. You no. don't want to the opposite of positive reinforcement. You you want to deter them and others from doing the crime. Okay. Okay. Yeah. So that's what, what we. But this is something else, yeah. Linda. You're saying something a little bit different. In other words, there have to be there has to be consequences in order to maintain a societal. Once you let things go, then then that's it. So it doesn't have to be specifically not to do this. It's just that there has to be a system that is that is being held up. Okay. Yeah, you throw the law. Right. 
Right. Okay, good. Again, that's, yeah, that's, so that's uh, again, deterrence. Okay, good. Dr. Yeah. Dr. Maxey said to protect the, the. Oh, yes. That's what it was. Right. Yes. Thank you for reminding me. Right. So sometimes we punish to protect others from someone who might otherwise be harmful and dangerous. Good. Um, Judaism has a bit of a different angle on this and all of the above, and it's really about rehabilitation. Punishment is at the core about rehabilitation, not that you don't have to protect others from society and not that others shouldn't learn and be deterred and not that this person should, but ultimately it is about rehabilitation. And those of you that took that course, this will sound familiar. It's like, ah, that's right. That was the punchline, right? It was, it's about rehabilitation. If it's about rehabilitation, so that means that you want to teach the person that this thing is inherently not good. To teach someone that something is inherently not good, the best way to do that is if the consequences are inherent. Are you with me on this? What's the best? Okay, this is going to sound terrible, but whatever. What is the... How did we learn not to touch fire? By touching fire. By touching fire. <laughs> and what happened when we touched fire? It hurt. Yeah, we got burned, right? And it hurt. So we're like, okay, so I'm not going to do that. Right, so that's, that's the most effective way of educating. And what I would say reforming, right, would be to feel the result, to really feel the, re the consequence of the negative behavior and to feel it as negative. Does that make sense? In other words, if I still believe that this is fine, just someone else has a rule and therefore they're going to punish me, that's not going to really change something inside. There's something called the Restorative Justice Project. Anybody familiar with this, Restorative Justice? Mm -hmm. Restorative justice is somebody commits a crime and they have whatever their sensing is, but part of that is, and they may work with the prosecution and the judges and whatever to reduce some, some time and that sort of thing. They will meet with the victim's family and they will have a face-to-face. -face. And, and there's on many levels, this is effective and it's transformational, um, but there's also, in my opinion, you have to look up the website and see what their you know, founding principles are. But in my understanding, it's based on a very simple premise. And that is the most effective education that someone who committed a crime could receive is the realization that this hurt someone. Here is the result of the hurt. Here is the family that got hurt. You hug them and cry with them and feel the pain. Don't be detached from the pain. I committed a crime and then Again, we, there's, there's different takes on this, but that is, in my opinion, that is one powerful element of it. In Judaism, yes. Um, okay, so the uh, headmaster of the Hebrew Academy uh, had an interesting uh, way of doing that. Uh, the first day of school, we got there and there was a big red swastika on the building, first day in the new building. And so he was able to find out three guys from affluent families that did it. So rather than put them in jail or whatever, he told that he gave them an assignment. They were to study the Holocaust. And at the completion of that, they were to go in front of their school and teach the kids, tell them about the Holocaust and then do it in the Hebrew Academy. Wow. And I think that hit its mark. That's powerful. Uh, it reminds me of what Rabbi Silverman, Chabad of East Cobb, what he did, you know, a few months ago or several months ago, around the there were swastikas in uh, some, some high schools in East Cobb, yes. and it, it made the news, and there were protests, and they, they expelled the kids. Yeah. And Rabbi Silverman said, that's not going to do anything. That's not going to, that's an extrinsic punishment. Mm -hmm. That's you're trying to, you're hitting someone for this, you're not educating them, you're not teaching them why it's wrong. They don't, he brought in a Holocaust survivor to speak with him. They spoke with a survivor. That's going to do something. Are you guys with me on this? Yeah. So something that's intrinsic and organic makes sense. We have a rule that God's consequences are always mida keneged mida, which means that the punishment, the consequence is commensurate, fits, mida means the fit, fits the crime. Divine punishment. Human punishment is all over the place, right? Human punishment is all over the place. Divine punishment is always me to connect me to, which therefore is my third question. I, we were what does this mean, Rabbi? Can you repeat those? What the, did you in Hebrew? Say? Yeah, Mida. No, in, in Wait, English. what? In English? Yeah. Oh, oh, the punishment fits the crime. So in this case, in this case, we might ask the question, and this is my third question. Korach 
and Dutton and Abiram, they're swallowed into the earth. And the 250 people that brought the fire pan, they are burned by fire. They brought the incense to ruin by fire. How do these punishments fit the crime? Does that make sense? How is it Mida connect and Mida? How the fact that Korach did this, why he swallowed by the earth, and then the, these guys did that, and they're burned by fire. What's the connection? The si- I'm going to give you the simple explanation, and then we're going to go much deeper. What are the simple ways of understanding this? Experiencing. Oh, let's see. Yeah, but why these specific uh, consequences? Let's take a look at the Abarbanel. Schlockrock would had a song back in the day. They uh, used popular tunes with uh, Jewish themes. Ba 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 banel. Ba 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 banel. I've shared that before. I'm sure that little ditty sounds familiar. All right. Text number three. The Abar Banel asks the question that I just asked. Marnine, if you don't mind, please read text number three. Why did Moses pray for the earth to open up and swallow them after the fire to burn them? And why did he see fit to spread it to the earth to open up and swallow? What's the connection is there between the punishment? Yeah, that last question is powerful. What connection is there between this punishment and their sin? The premise of that is that there should be a connection between the punishment and the sin, between what they did and what happened to them, because God doesn't punish or meet out consequences willy-nilly. God does so, mida, connect, and mida. It fits the, the, the punishment or the consequence, it fits the crime. Again, it's like the fire burning. It's part of nature. It's a natural experience. It's not an extrinsic punishment. Or consequence. So let's take a look at, at Rabbeinu Bechaya, who gives a very straightforward answer. We're not going to settle with this answer. We're going to go much deeper. But let's start with this. At least get, get some, some classic perspective. Linda, please read this one. Text number four, where he explains the connection between the punishment and the crime. God matches the punishment to the crime. Korah wanted a high punishment, a high position that he didn't deserve. Therefore, he was punished by being relegated to a position below the earth. Korah was the prototype of all those who arrogantly and inappropriately seek lofty positions. The punishment by fire was also measure for measure. The 250 who were also firstborns had offered incense, which was a privilege they hadn't earned. And and that that last paragraph, for whatever reason, is translated incorrectly. I'm going to fill in the translation, but let's go one at a time. So the question is, how does the punishment fit the crime? So let's start with Korah. Korah, what did he want? So he said power to the people, but really what he wanted was power for himself. He wanted to overthrow Moses and Aaron, become the leader. So he wanted to go high. So what happens instead? He goes <laughs> low. Yeah, so that's kind of me. It kind of fits. He wanted to go high. He dug himself a grave. Okay, fine. Uh, that's a good question. I don't know. Marnie's asking, is he still there? Like, where did he go? Like, physically? Did Oh, he went alive in the earth, and then what happened next is anyone's guess. Um, but the point is that he wanted to go high, he went low. You know what they say? The only job that you start at the top is digging graves. It's the only job you start at the top, right? Anyway, but this guy dug his own, this guy essentially dug his own grave, right? He wanted to go high, and yeah, at Dinamarca. Oh, yeah. um, he couldn't learn anything and he couldn't learn from his sin. He just. Right. But at least on some level, the punishment is fitting. It's actually the inverse of what he did. Like he wanted to go high. He went low. Again, this is. Well, maybe his soul learned something. Maybe his soul learned something. Good. Right. About the consequence. You you overextend. You end up, you know, you pull the, the, the rubber band too far. It's going to snap back at you. Something like that. You could say something good. Yeah, you could say something like that. that he learned something. Or at least we, we're learning about the. The effect you you seek power um, in a, in a, in a uh, in an incorrect way, it's going to come back to not only not get that, but it's going to reduce your name to uh, to a lower place. Fine, okay. Then we have the two hundred and fifty. The two hundred and fifty were punished by fire. That's also he says measure for measure. Why? Because they had offered incense. Now in the original it says bo lahakriv ketoras agabi ha'esh. They they came to bring ketoret. They came to bring incense agabi ha'esh. On top of fire, on fire. Therefore, they were judged or punished with fire. So since they brought the incense on fire, they were punished with fire. In other words, what's the expression? Fire. Um, yeah, it's an expression that I can't think of. What's the, what's the fire expression? Fight fire with fire. Yes, fight fire with fire. Exactly. So God fought their fire. 
with his own fire. So, oh, you bring fire, fire. So that's how, this is how a classic Torah commentator, look, he lived in the 1200s, 1300s. Cla I'm just giving you classic understanding, explanation. What, like 800 years ago, 700 years ago, 500 years ago, what were they, what were they uh, talking about? What were they, what was the understanding of, of, of why these punishments specifically? So here we have it. Korach wanted to seek, uh, he had grandiose dreams of, of, of leadership. And he got, he lost everything. Okay, he sunk down. That's embodied in the sinking down into the earth. And the 250 people, they brought fire, right? They brought unsolicited fire, unwarranted fire, unkosher fire. So they got burnt in fire. There you go. Uh, however, these answers, while classic, and certainly I cannot uh, have any questions against them. Nonetheless, one, someone else could say, perhaps there's still something insufficient. Why? Because number one, Korach didn't just fall down low. The earth swallowed him up. And I dropped that breadcrumb earlier, slash Easter egg, no, breadcrumb earlier. Right, the earth didn't just open up as a sinkhole and he fell low. That would be high low. No, he fell low and then the earth swallowed. So the question is, what is the extra message of the swallowing of the earth, not just falling down, but being swallowed? Are you with me on this? And in fact, the Torah repeats it multiple times, swallowed by the earth. Swallowed by the earth, swallowed by So there's something about the earth closing as well. So what does that mean? And then number two, fire, fighting fire with fire. Okay, there's got to be something a little bit deeper. I don't really have a question here. But there, there, there likely is something a little bit deeper, which, of course, we will get to based on the teachings of Kabbalah and Hasidic philosophy, as well as Jewish philosophy. So let's, uh, let's jump in to the next part of the class. Yes, Ma. I have I have one I have one factual question. Were, were all the whole household swallowed up? Yes. Yes. Okay. And the other question is, but where's the where's the rehab? Where is the rehab? The, where's the where, yeah? Where's so the, so I think did you mention this about the soul? Yes. Yeah. So maybe the soul. Not out. Oh, listen. What what about capital punishment? What happens about capital punishment? It's uh, sometimes it only happens. The next stage. Sometimes the body is too far gone and uh, it can't be rehabbed. Anyway, let's uh, let's look at let's look at the next the next piece of this. What was so we see the punishment and the fallout and the consequence. We question the consequence, but let's look at what got Korach, what got him going in the first place. Now, there's what he said, and then there's what we think he meant. But let's look at what he said. Here's what he said. Text number five. Um, text number five, and let's ask Linda. You read, right? You read last. You did read. Okay, no, so right. Sandrine, Sandrine, take it away. Hold on one second. Sandrine, please read text number five. So if we're trying to get into, thank you, if we're trying to get to what Korach actually says, okay? So what he actually says is the quote of, of in text number, in, in verse number three, okay? And he says, uh, you have taken too much greatness for yourselves, Moses and Aaron. This whole nation is holy. This whole nation is holy. God is among us all. Why should you rise above God's congregation? Honestly, sounds pretty good. This sounds like power to the people. Uh, it sounds like, I mean, it's, I think it's appropriate that you read it, Sandrine. Sounds like the French Revolution. <laughs> Liberté, égalité, fraternité, right? We're all one. We're all equal. We're all holy. Why, why are you raising, why the hierarchy? What the need for that? At Sinai, was there a hierarchy? I mean, the answer is yes. But anyway, well, at Sinai, because Moses was the only one allowed in the mountain. But theoretically, God spoke to all of us. We all have the same mitzvahs. We all keep the same Shabbos. We all wear the same film. We all like the, the same Shabbat candles. We eat the same kosher. What makes you greater than us? Now, 
if you now if you say that Korach really wanted power for himself, then okay, fine. So then this was just this wasn't real, it was just a ruse. But if we take his argument at face value, his argument is everyone's holy, God is with all of us. Why do you rise above the congregation? If you take that those words at face value, it actually seems like a reasonable argument. In fact, one could say more than reasonable, maybe it's even a holy argument. One could say, because, and I'll tell you why. Because what he's essentially saying is, yeah, that we all have equal value. We all matter. We're all important. We shouldn't rank human beings higher or lower. This person's greater, that person, right? Do you want a system, a societal system where people rank greater than others? I, I think that's not an ideal system. So Korach was advocating, right, ostensibly. If you take, his, if you take him at face value, he was advocating for a societal setup where everybody's equal, not only a setup, right? a, a, a society that reflects the truth, that everyone is equal, everyone has value, everyone is, he wanted, again, at face value, what he wanted was everyone should be represented, everyone should have, should be valued, and everyone should be together, achdut, right, unity, everyone is equal, everyone is holy, so there's this unity, it's not, it's not like me versus you, you're greater than me. Rabbi, so the question is, so the question, the, the question number one is, where did he go wrong? It seems like a valid argument. Yeah. So what about the whole idea of the priestly kind of story? Oh, that's, he was, he was going against Moses and Aaron. He said, Moses, you're the leader. Aaron, you're the priest. Let's do away with everything. Let's just eliminate all hierarchy. We let's no hierarchy yet. Saying where everyone where there's chaos because no one knows their role. Okay, I hear it. Right, you're saying too many opinions is going to ruin the thing. I hear you. Okay, I hear you. But yeah. Okay. So all right, hold on one second. Good, 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 good. So Elio is saying, so, sounds like the Bolshevik Revolution. Number one, number two, uh, number two is that um, what's the complaint against Moses and Aaron? It comes from, it's coming from God, which is what Moses tells Korah. He says, don't, you, it's not an issue with me. It's an issue with the one who set this up. Granted. But again, if we just, if we just go to the core argument, the argument seems a bit valid. Okay. Just one second. It seems a little valid. Number one, number two, question number two is the irony here is that this call for unity this call honoring everybody right that call for like everyone's holy and everyone should be equal and everyone should be, should be together and you know that actually split the nation so what's interesting is and what's maybe one could say ironic is that an attempt to equalize everyone is actually splitting everyone creating a fracture right it's crazy so and in fact if we look at text number 10 Let's look at text number 10. We find something fascinating. Sorry, text number six. I don't know why I said 10. Whatever. Text number six. The Talmud says something fascinating. Um, Elio, please read this one. Rob said that the one who is involved in a quarrel transgresses a negative precept. As it says, one should not be the Torah and his congregation. And look at this. The Talmud says that anyone for all time who's involved in a quarrel, anyone who's in a fight, is transgressing a negative precept. It's one of the 365 do not do's in Torah. It says, do not be like Korach, which means that anytime somebody gets into a fight, it's like Korach. So one second, Korach was theoretically the greatest peacemaker. Are you with me on this? Not that he actually achieved peace, but he was offering up a vision of society in which everybody's equal, and yet it ends up devolving into a fight, into a quarrel, into, into fragmenting society. And the question is, how, does, how do you go from the theory of unity to the practice of abject disunity? Understand the question? And, and you, you know what? You could, if you want to get polit uh, not political, but like if you want to talk about, um, you know, uh, um, societal worldviews, you could ask this question about communism, socialism. How do you go from a theory that scene that paints such a beautiful picture to a reality that is so different than that beautiful picture, right? The, the theory is we'll all get along, we'll all, we're all valued, we're all equal. Equality, not a bad thing. 
equality. It's a good thing. And yet it evolves into just fragmentation, brokenness, and abject chaos to the point that anyone who ever gets into a fight, ah, you're like Korach, don't be like Korach. Korach, the ultimate fighter. So text number seven is how the Rebbe asked this question. Take a look at how the Rebbe at, frames this question. Um, Charna, please read this. Unity ach dut. Ach dut. Like echad? Yeah, ach dut means like the, the way of being echad. Yeah, the modality of being at one is ach dut. Maybe. No, dalad vav taf. Just one. Charna. Text number seven. Here's how the Rebbe phrases the question. How could a command to unity among Jews result in dispute? And how could the dispute be so polarizing that it's become the prototype for every quarrel among Jews forever after? Right? So that's the question. A demand for unity ends in dispute? How? I mean, obviously, you just read the story and that's what happened. But, like, it seems so weird that that's what happened. And the dispute is so polarizing that it's the prototype for every quarrel for all time. All right, so for this, we need to uh, lay, out, lay out the situation. We've asked all the questions. Now it's time to present some answers. And we, the, the, first, uh, the first issue we're going to address is the issue that we just asked, which is how do you go from unity to disunity? How do you go from a call for equality into abject chaos? The answer is because, of Korach, because Korach missed a very important point. You see, Korach was calling for pure equality in the sense, I don't mean in necessarily in the sense that it's used today, but in the sense that everybody is equal, i.e. the same. And that is not true because people are not the same. See, there's diff- there's, there, there are two different issues. The question is, are people the same versus the question is, are, are, are people valued the same? There's two different questions. Number one, are people the same? The answer is no. God created a world filled with diversity. God created a world of diversity intentionally. God didn't create one thing a trillion times. God created a trillion different things, right? That's the way it is in life. Every person is unique. Every plant is unique. Every animal is unique. Every species is unique. Everything has its place. There's a sun and a moon and the stars and a planet and people on the planet. Everything has its place. God creates the one God created a diverse, a diverse unity. God loves many things clearly because he created it. He loves diversity. A person that comes along and says, no, 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 no. Everything needs to look the same. Everyone has to have the same job. You shouldn't have a job. That's more important than my job. You shouldn't have that job. And I have this job. We should all have the same job. That person is denying reality. And it's also denying, it's also not honoring the individual. In other words, at the time, I would say the Hebrew, babasha, which means at the very same time that you're trying to argue that everyone is equal or everyone is valued, you are devaluing the individual by not valuing the individuality. Does that make sense? Yes. In other words, by trying to make everyone the same, to try to say, well, because I believe that everyone has value, you're actually devaluing. If I believe, yeah, that because everybody is values, everyone should look the same. That's not respectful. That's not respectful. That's, but that's not respectful. If I come, if I believe that in society, everyone should speak the same language and have the same culture and speak and wear the same clothes and make the same food and whatever, that's, it's not kosher. It's not okay. It's not nice. That doesn't mean I value everybody. It means I don't value everybody. Are you with me on this? If everybody is equal, therefore everyone's the same, then that means I don't value everybody. Because if I value you, then I'll let you be as you are unique. Does that make sense? Yes. Right? If I really value. So what was Korach saying? Moshe and Aaron, you shouldn't be leaders because everyone's valuable. So what? People shouldn't have different jobs? Why is that valuable? That's not honoring. If somebody is a leader and you say, you can't be a leader, you can't be a leader because we all have to be, we all have to be the same, right? We all have to be the same. Well, then you're devaluing the role of an individual. Everyone has a different role. 
everyone has a different value. Everyone brings something else to the table. So this reminds me of, of what happened with, with the students of Rabbi Akiva. Famously, 24,000 students of Rabbi Akiva passed away uh, after Passover in the time of the counting of the Omer, which is why it's a time of a kind of a mini fast. Not, sorry, not mini fast. A mini time of, of mourning. La Bomer, they, they stopped, the dying stopped. Um, but they passed away. And the reason why they passed away, according to uh, the Talmud, is because Shalaynagu covered Zelaza. They didn't treat each other with respect. So the Rebbe asked the question the students of Rabbi didn't treat each other with respect. He taught one of his famous teachings was love your fellows yourself. And that's a biblical commandment. He said, Zek Klal Gadabat Torah. This is a, the great principle of the Torah. He taught that. How could his students not honor each other? And the answer is they loved each other so much that they didn't allow each other to be individuals. In other words, love is dangerous. Okay, let's think about it in scholarship, in Torah scholarship. Let's say we're all learning from Rabbi Akiva. And I think I have a clear understanding of what he said. And you and I are learning. And you tell me what you think, your opinion. And I'm like, you're totally wrong, right? Obviously, the way I understand it is the real understanding. And your opinion is frankly wrong, right? That's what I believe. And I tell that to you. I said, let me educate you. Let me, let me explain to you what he really meant. Because I know. Because I love you. So I want you to have it correctly. You with me on this? <laughs> okay. So because of my love, I don't respect you. Because love equals sameness. Respect equals difference. When somebody says, I respect your opinion, it doesn't mean that they have the same opinion. It usually means that they have a different opinion. That's why I use the word respect. Are you with me? Now, not everyone respects every opinion, which is the problem but respect and love are different things when 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 someone says something and you're like oh i love that you know what it means you agree with it when someone says something and say i can respect that you know what it means you don't agree but you can respect it respect means you can honor difference are you with me on this okay so what does it mean to truly value the other person doesn't mean to try to make them like you it means to value their to respect and value their unique distinctiveness. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. So that is a definite, a working definition of what true valuing the other one means. <laughs> true. If I really value you, I'm not trying to change. you. If I truly value you, I respect you for who you are as an individual. So if Korach really valued every single Jew, he would say, Moses, I love you. I respect you. You're a leader. He wouldn't try to tear down Moses. Does that make sense? To try to tear down Moses means he doesn't value Moses. He values sameness, which is not a person. It's a concept. Are you with me on this? If you really value people, if you really value a culture, you will not try to change it. If you really value a person, you will not want, you do not want them to drop their talents. If I say to you, you we all have to fit in. We all have to fit in. So for you have a unique skill, erase it and do what, every, what everyone else is doing. That is not valuing, that is not honoring, that is not respecting, that is not, that's horrible, it's horrible. If you have a bunch of kids and you have the same expectations from all of them, that is really bad parenting. Sorry for, sorry for judging, but that's not good parenting because every kid is the world. Every kid is individual. Know thy child said, me now right you got to know your kid and what's what's the best for one kid will be the worst for the other kid can i know i have a few of them uh, and and i can relate what's right for one kid is not what's right for the other kid so if i say i love my kids i treat everyone as equal rules sounds great sounds great in theory in theory dad of the year in theory dad of the year in practice not so much not so much. If I'm treating every individual the same, expecting everything the same, right? Giving them the same opportunities. What about this kid's musical talent? I'm not honoring that if I only give them basketball lessons. Are you with me on this? I don't, does anyone get lessons in basketball? Is that a good example? Probably not. I hope, I hope what I'm saying makes sense. Yes. So what is, Ko, so what is Korach saying? What is Korach saying? Everyone's the same. Moses, stop being Moses. Aaron, stop being Aaron. Everyone's the same. What's wrong with that? Why does that create fragmentation? What's wrong? 
What's wrong? The whole thing is wrong. People aren't the same. <sighs> Text 8A. Text 8A. Powerful stuff. Um, Howard, please read text 8a. This is what Moses says to Korach. In the morning, God will make known to Israel through his prophet. Uh, Moses says to Korach, tomorrow morning, God's going to show you just who is the leader and who's not the leader. God is going to prove to you once and for all what the score is. But he says in the morning. Why in the morning? Look at text AB, Rashi. I'll read this one. Moses said to Korach, God assigned boundaries to his world. You know what boundaries really means? Not limits in this case. Boundaries means diversity. God created different things. Are you able to transform morning into, into evening? Doing so is as impossible as it would be for you to undo the separation. You with me on this? Look at why does Moses say morning? Just like you can't change night into day, you can't change a Moses into a Korach, a Korach into an Aaron. You can't do it. People are individuals. Not to not to harp on this uh, on this kids example, but Manus Freeman once shares a story. He once met someone, and uh, they said, "How many kids do you have?" And I think Manus has like fourteen kids. He said, 14. And this woman was visibly disturbed. 14 children. She was like annoyed. He said to her, which one of them shouldn't I have had? Let me tell them. Let, just tell me who I should tell you shouldn't be here. There are 14 worlds, 14 individual worlds, 14 realities. You don't have to think about anyone else. Just think of yourself right now. Don't think of anyone else or any kid or this or that. Just think of yourself. There's no one like you. You are irreplaceable. If someone said you have to be like someone else, you have to conform and be like someone else, that is the greatest affront slash chutzpah to who you are. I should conform to, I should be like you. Why? Because we're all holy. We're all holy. So what does that have to do with anything? You know what else is holy? The sun and the moon. Day and night are holy. And they're different things. That's what Moses was telling uh, Korach. He was telling him, Boker, in the morning you will know. What does that mean in the morning you will know? The morning itself should educate you. Just like there's morning and there's night and there are different things. And that's okay. And that's necessary in this world. So too, there's a Korach and a Moses. And there's two different people. And that's okay. We have different roles. And that's okay. It, it sounds obvious. Uh, just to finish that text, because uh, I know it stopped in the middle. Doing so is as impossible as it would be for you to undo this separation. As the verse states, it was evening and it was morning, and he separated. In other words, the word vayavdel, and he separated. Some it says that Aaron was set apart to sanctify him, separated again is vayavdel. Uh, you can't see it in the English. I, I, it bugs me when they translate the same words differently. Just it doesn't create that, that, uh, that sameness. Vayavdel, like havdala, vayavdel. God separated Yavdel between day and night by Yavdel, and he separated between Aaron, Aaron, the Kohen, and non priests. So the same, the same God that creates separation between day and night creates separation between priests and everyone else, right? Is that, is that elitist? Is that, I don't know, racist? Is that, I, I, I don't know what to call it, but it's, it's the fact. God created day and night. There's two different things. That doesn't make it any. Thing. It just makes it a reality. There is diversity. And when you honor diversity, you're actually honoring the other. When you deny diversity, you're actually dishonoring the other. Because what you're saying is, I don't value you as you. I value you as I see that you should be. And that's the worst. Korach says, Moses, I will value you when you look like I look like. When there's one homogenous mix. You know what's beautiful about art? Oh, I mean, there's different types of art. One type of art that's beautiful is an art is art that has many different colors. Many different colors that each color shines through. You know what happens when you take all the colors and mix them all together? Mm -hmm. It becomes kind of like a mush and you don't see anything, right? We don't want a chalant. We want a chicken soup. A chicken soup means you have the broth, you have the matzo balls, you have the... the um, you have the noodles, right? You have 
the yeah oh yeah oh nice nice you have the carrot you have the sweet potato you have the leeks you have the onion you have whatever your thing is i mean i'm not going to share the recipe that we do the now schmaltz. maybe i will <laughs> we don't do schmaltz but anyway i'm saying we don't do schmaltz, schmaltz yeah you you can make you can make something so homogenous that n that you that n nothing is left versus retaining the individuality korach says what does korach say korach says kulam kedoshim everyone is holy everyone is equal and moses says equal no not equal everyone is different and honestly everyone being different is actually more valuable than everyone being equal now but I, with the obvious caveat when we say everyone is different we don't mean therefore we can discriminate there's no one's talking about discrimination here. there's no discrimination what we're saying is people are different and that is okay this is the lesson that Moses, sorry, this is the lesson that Korach missed on a very simple level. But if we go deeper, there's another element here. Because if we go deeper, what we might realize is that Korach didn't just miss something very elementary. Korach was actually having a perspective that was very divine. And this is how we're going to end the class, trying to justify Korach for a moment. But still, he was not correct. Let's explain. God created a world of diversity. And at the same time, at the core of this diversity is oneness. Why? Because the same divine energy that flows into the sun, flows into the moon, flows into the planets, flows into you and me and the trees and the animals. Yes, there are particulars that are different. Yes, there is diversity. But at the core, at the core, core, core of everything is the one God. Let me give you an example. Imagine... You see a rainbow. You see a bunch of different colors. What forms the rainbow? How does a rainbow form? It's light, pure light, being refracted by droplets of water, right? And those droplets of water create, uh, unleash the colors, right? Refract the colors of the rainbow, of the the rain that make they make the rainbow. You could take a uh, a prism, right? A prism and do the same thing. And you take light, and then it's bent in different ways, and it produces the rainbow. So here are two models. You can look at the rainbow and say, "I honor you." you look at all the colors. I honor you, red. You, orange. You, yellow. You, blue. You, green. You, per I honor all of the colors individually. Don't mush them together. I honor each of you individually. That's what we talked about. They don't have to be the same. I honor each of you as you are. But then there's another perspective that says, I know who you are, red. You're pure light. You just look red, but you're really pure. And I know who you are, yellow. You're also pure light. And I know who you are, orange. You're also pure light. Are you with me on this example? Yes. Korach saw the light, not the rainbow. You with me? Korach, on a, on, a, on a lower level, we could say that Korach missed this obvious point. On a deeper level, I'm going deeper now to, to, to conclude this class. On a deeper level, we could say that Korach didn't miss the basic point that God created diversity. Korach got that, but he wanted to go deeper. He said, yes, there's diversity, but at the core of diversity is really oneness. I see the rainbow. Of course, the rain. God created the rainbow. But God created all the colors, which means that at the core of all the colors is the same oneness. He saw the oneness. And yet that was still wrong. Why? Because we live in a world in which we do see the colors. We don't see the light. We don't see the pure light. Korach was ahead of his time. He was a man that was ahead of his time. Korach was living with a Mashiach mindset, with a Messianic mindset. He was living in the times of Mashiach when God's oneness will be revealed to all. In the times of Mashiach, in the Messianic era, everyone will see and know God. Isaiah writes, all flesh, not the eyes, flesh itself will see. Flesh will see. You will perceive. Everything will perceive. That the God, that the word, that the mouth of God is speaking. In other words, that everything is coming from God. When Mashiach comes, it will be obvious that all of this is coming from the one God. Korach saw that then. He saw the oneness. And so he said, everyone's holy. 
He wasn't trying to undo the diversity. He was trying to go deeper than diversity. God created a diverse world, but look at the other side. That's on this side of the canvas. Look behind the canvas. What's there? Only oneness. So on this side, there's diversity. You got to honor diversity. On the other side, there's only God's pure oneness. He was honoring God's pure oneness, but it was a mistake. Why? Because he was ahead of his time. We live in a world in which we don't see that. Korach saw that, but again, sometimes when you're ahead of your time, it can lead to disaster. Because he was living in a place that was deeper than, 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 than everyone else could relate to, that is why his actions, the actions that he took were incorrect. He took actions based on his vision of reality that just wasn't, that wasn't uh, appropriate, which is why Richard's asking, so why was he punished? It's exactly why he was punished. He was punished because sometimes when you overextend and you reach beyond where you're ready or where others are ready, it causes havoc, it causes chaos. When you extend beyond, right, that creates, that creates a breach, that creates a break. Because here you have someone who's extended beyond, but everyone is here, that creates a break in the back. Think of, think of uh, the Peloton, think of uh, bike racing, where you have a group and then you have a separation. People go ahead, and now you have two groups. That's what Korach did. He split the group. Korach had a vision of a world where he saw a world of unity, a world of oneness, because he saw from God's perspective but that was way ahead of his time. And so he broke away. And that breaking away creates now a split, which is why Korach is the source of splintering. Anytime someone splits, it's Korach. Korach was the original splitter. He created the first split, as it were. Now, he had decent intentions, but he created the split. When you create a split, what happens? Some go up. And some go down. And that's what happened in this case. Some went up in fire and some went down into the earth. And those that went into the earth, they got covered by the earth. Because when it goes, when you try to go up and you can't go up, then the fall is way lower than, than where you were before. And it gets absolutely buried. There are, I'm, I'm, a, I'm, I'm leaving out all of the Kabbalistic terminology to this idea. And it's really beautiful, but it's very esoteric. I'm hoping that this makes sense. And I'm hoping we can relate to it in our time. There are visionaries in our times, visionaries in past time that were ahead of their time. And, and when they lived, they were mocked and ridiculed and people, people got upset at them because they were visionaries. So on one level, Korach is a visionary. Now that may, may make him sound like a hero, but you know when you play with fire, all no puns intended necessarily, but when you play with fire on that level, it actually could be very destructive. When you see things through that lens and, and, and have expectations of people on that level that are not appropriate for the time. And when you cause havoc on the ground based on your vision of an ideal state, that creates real problems below. When you try to govern a community or govern a society based on your, your idealism, that can create a lot of, that can bury a lot of people on the ground. So, so, you know, a lot of policies that may make sense on paper don't make sense on the ground. Korach had a policy on paper. His policy was everyone's holy. Everyone's spectacular. Everyone's amazing. He had a messianic policy. His policy was messianic. And he was right, ultimately, but not then. And what happened then was it caused discord on the ground, havoc on the ground, and absolute abject chaos. So, my friends, in summation, in summation, we have a lot of things that we can learn from today's class. Number one, value the other for who they are, not for who you want them to be. If you really value the other, you will value them for who they are uniquely individually. Value yourself for who you are. Don't, me don't measure yourself against anyone else. It's one of the dangers of social media is that we begin comparing our lives to others. Don't do that. Don't, don't korach yourself. Let's just call that koraching yourself. Korach means I need to be equal to the other. No, you don't. Be you. Mark Twain once wrote, be yourself. Everyone else is taken. Right? That's a good thing. Be yourself. Be yourself. Be you. Don't make them be like you. Don't make you be like them. Be yourself. Be an individual. Next lesson. Lesson number two. There are ideals and dreams that we all have whether, whatever it is, spiritual, not spiritual, there are ideals and dreams. We have to be very careful to not conflate the ideal with the real. We have to be careful not to let 
philosophy and idealism get in the way of putting one foot in front of in front of the next. Korach says, let's live messianic. Let's live on God's terms. And Moses says, but we're here. But this is where we're at. And to do that is just going to cause everything to spin out of control. What that means practically, I don't know. We can all think of it on our, on our, in our own lives, what that means for ourselves. Maybe it means when we get excited, in, you know, Jewishly, we get excited. Make sure you're putting one foot in front of the next. Make sure we're not overextending as we try to reach for the next you know, for the next step in our, in our Judaism and our spiritual growth. You know, one of, one of my favorite insights into the Mishkan is it says about the altar, God says, don't create steps for the altar, create a ramp. I once saw a beautiful insight. What's the difference between steps and ramps? It sounds pretty much the same. Steps you're taking, you know, you're, you're lifting your leg. I mean, you lift your leg to walk anyway, but like you're, you're, you're extending up, whereas a ramp is smooth. How do you get up to the altar? How do you get up to that sacred space of the altar? Smooth, step-by-step. Step. Climbing is good, but you got to be careful when you climb because you might fall. If you try to go too far, too fast, it could backfire. Korach tried to go too far, too fast, and it backfired. The lesson for us is slow and steady wins the race. Two lessons. Two lessons perhaps we can uh, integrate into our lives. Respect the other. Respect yourself. That's lesson one. Number two, slow and steady. Create a plan for yourself. Create a trajectory for your own growth. Create a plan. Don't try to grab everything at once. It's not going to work. It's a, don't, don't korach yourself on that level either. Otherwise, either it's going to float away or it's going to bury you. Go either, either way, right? Sometimes people go way too fast and the next thing you know, they're out of touch. It's like, who are you? What happened to you? Can't even have a conversation with you. You're so holy. <laughs> you won't even talk to me anymore. You're too holy. Or they'll come crashing back down to the earth and will swallow them. Like, what happened to that inspired person? I don't see him anymore. You with me on this? Mm -hmm. Two practical, maybe four practical, whatever, um, insights from this lesson. Hope this made sense. Thank you for joining, as always, for uh, Wednesday night Torah study. Questions or comments? Jump in. All right. Yes. Hey, Mark. Yeah, hi. How are you? Mark uh, with the green screen. Yeah. <laughs> Over 10 years ago, I gave uh, a Devar Torah on this parsha, and talked about Korach having vision, uh, what I found was Korach had the gift of prophecy. He saw in the future and knew that he would be the progen progenitor of, I believe it was Samuel. And as such, he felt he was above just everyone else. And for that reason, he felt he had the right to take fire pans, make an unholy fire, which he thought would have been holy because his his descendant would be Samuel, perhaps the holiest of the prophets. Yeah. Yeah, interesting. So uh, again, similar concept, similar theme. You know, Shivan Panama Torah, 70 facets of the Torah. So he was, again, ahead of his time. He was thinking in the future and looking right. at his kids and then applying that to himself. Korach, with all due respect, you're not Samuel. Samuel, you're not Korach. Right. Just because he's going to be your right. our anical because your great great grandson doesn't mean that he's you. It's a difference, right? Um, good, Mark. Your Dvar Torah that ten years ago was relevant for tonight, which means that back then you were ahead of your time. Wow. I'm just wow. no, but Mark is still he's still good. Mark is still yeah. Baruch Hashem. He didn't go too far too fast. He's perfect, just where we like you. All right, questions? Yeah. The way you describe the student and the lag bulb mark. Yeah. So the one student that was correcting the other student, wasn't that a good thing? I mean, because again, the 70 facets and then also maybe you're trying to help him. Sure. Yeah. You know, many people try to help each other, try to help the other by saying, if you really want to get it right, you have to be like me. That's not helping. <laughs> that's, uh, that's making the other conform. If I tell you that you're wrong in your understanding, you have to think like me. There, there is a there is a model where that is healthy. We're learning together. I share my perspective. You share your perspective. We have a healthy dialogue. But where I try to make you think like me, and if you think differently, I don't accept that, and I can't I can't respect you because you think differently. That's when it's that's when it goes off the rails. That's exactly what happened with Rabbi Akiva. And again, understand how the Rebbe explains it. Rabbi Akiva was the one who taught, who promoted love, and the Rebbe said that's exactly what caused the problem. 
Because when you love without respect, that could be problematic because love means sameness. Love means I want you to be like me because I have the best. I want to share it with you. After all, I have it right. You should, you, you should only be so lucky to have it as right as me, right? If I really love you, I'll, I'll, I'll show you the truth. And if you don't want to see the truth, well, then I feel bad for you. I feel really bad for you, right? It's like, but I, I, it's like, ooh, ooh, I feel bad for them. So because Rabbi Kiva taught love, they were missing respect. <laughs> respect means that you can have a different opinion and that's okay also. They were missing that. So they couldn't, they couldn't treat each other with, with respect. They had too much love. By the way, in relationships, it's the same thing. Same thing in relationships. You can love the other and not respect them. And that's, a, that's a very dangerous place to be in. I love you. Therefore, it's always got to be together the same, whatever. But you need respect. Respect means you have your interests and your, your hobbies and talents and abilities, and, and I have mine, and that's okay. It doesn't have to be the same. Homogen, whatever. Being homogenous is not necessarily a, a recipe for a healthy for anything healthy, including a healthy relationship. All right. Um, awesome. Well, if Fred gives the thumbs up, then you know. Thank you. <laughs> thank you. All right. Fine. You can also give a thumbs up. All right. Thanks for joining tonight. Hope you enjoyed. We'll see you guys soon. Take care, everybody. Thank you. You guys go ahead.